Good morning again. Excited we get to open God's Word together. So uh, if you have been with us over the past uh, few weeks, we've been walking through the book of Matthew, and we culminated uh, uh, with the resurrection and Easter Sunday, which I think was a great place to be. Uh, And what this establishes is that Jesus is the King. He's the King. If you come back from the dead in the way that he came back and you do the miracles that he does, he's established himself as the king. And so what we're going to do now is we're going to dive back into the book of Matthew, look at some scenes and some episodes from uh, his life and some of his teachings, some of his stories and parables, and say, okay, if this king is alive, how then should we live? What should we do? We're going to look today about anxiety. We're going to be in Matthew chapter 6 verse 25 to 34, and anxiety in my experience has really revolved around uh, uh, really two concepts. I have needs and I have questions as to whether or not I have the resources to meet those needs. So it can be something as basic as food. I'm hungry. I want to eat. Do I have anything in my kitchen to eat? Do I have the money that I need to go buy the food that I want to eat? But it can also be something complicated and abstract. I can ask questions such as, I'm getting a promotion. Do I have what it takes to do the job that's being presented before me? Or I'm having a child. Do I have what it takes to raise a child? The thing I told myself when I was faced with having a child was there are people dumber than me who have raised children. (laughs) And I've pretty much been riding that idea ever since. Anxiety is about trying to figure out, do I have the resources? And when you have doubts about what you, if you have what it takes, when you have doubts about the resources you have, that's when you develop stress, anxiety, fear, and worry. And there's a difference today. I won't be talking necessarily about things like chronic anxiety, what I talked about, my struggle. I think there's some things we'll talk about that maybe could help somebody in that situation. But I'm talking about just everyday worry, stress, and fear. Okay? How do we properly manage this kind of worry in our lives? I think it revolves around managing three things. Managing disappointment, managing satisfaction, and managing reality. Disappointment, satisfaction, and reality. Let's talk about the disappointment that comes from worrying. Look at verse 25 of Matthew 6. Therefore, I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? And which of you, by being anxious, can add a single hour to his or her span of life? And why are you anxious about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is alive and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? So one of the things that anxiety does to us is it makes us diminish the idea of what life is all about. Jesus tells his disciples in verse 25, do not be anxious about your life. And then he makes comparisons to birds and lilies to highlight what his teachings are about life. And usually what people think life is, life is what I eat, what I drink, and what I wear. Now what is Jesus doing when he talks about these concepts? He's drawing our attention to the major components of life. What's going on inside of our bodies, inside, eating and drinking, and what's going on outside of our bodies, clothing. And usually, most people that define life in a very small way will say, as long as everything's good on my inside, as long as I'm happy, healthy, comfortable on the inside, and as long as everything outside of me is going well, work's going well, family's going well, there's no real stressors outside, then life is good. If everything's copacetic inside and out, life is good. But Jesus says this is not the case. Because life is more. Verse 25. Do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Life is more than what's going on inside and outside your body. Life is more than that. 
It's more significant than that. It's not just about comfort and security and happiness. It's more than that. But anxiety calls our attention back to that all the time. Stop me if you've heard this before. Actually, don't. I'm just going to keep going. (laughs) I need to eat right. I need to eat healthy. Because if I don't, I'll get cholesterol. And if I get cholesterol, I'll have a heart attack. And if I have a heart attack, I'll die. Or, I need to get a good job so I can climb the ladder, I can be successful, and I won't be a disappointment to anybody because I don't want to die a disappointment, a failure. Or, I need to be in relationships with other people, I need to have a good community, I need to have a good family, I need to get married and have kids, because if I don't, I'll be alone and I'll die alone. That is anxiety calling our attention back to these basic everyday fears. But Jesus says life is more than living and dying. Mark 8, 35, Jesus says, whoever saves his life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for my sake will save it. That statement makes zero sense. If your concept of life is living and dying, if it's about eating, drinking, and wearing clothes, that concept is is, is nonsensical. But it's why Jesus says, life is bigger than this. And this is how anxiety makes us lose sight of what life really is. And so if we lose sight of what life is, we lose sight of what's significant about life. And Jesus illustrates this by giving us the birds and the grass. Now these are incredibly insignificant things. In one translation, it describes them as the ravens. The ravens. We get all poetic and romantic about ravens because of Edgar Allan Poe. They didn't back then. Ravens were like grackles. If you hit one with your car, your greatest concern is for your car, not for the grackle. If you park under a tree for any length of time, your tree will be painted oddly when you're out of wherever you're at. Hate these things. Lilies are not Easter lilies like we got last week. This is like like dandelions, okay? My little girls love dandelions. They bring me the little flowers. They're like, Daddy, look, I got you a flower. And I'm like, oh, baby girl, that's sweet. Daddy's put weed killer on the the yard and he's going to kill all those. I don't tell them that because I'm kind, but that's what happens. These are insignificant, immaterial things. But God says, Jesus says, they don't store, they don't spin, and he takes care of them. He takes care of them. And we use these things as images for like the pinnacle of things that we want in our life. If somebody is just carefree and happy, we describe them as what? They're free as a bird. Exactly. Last week, I had a bunch of women and girls all around campus wearing their fine Easter dresses. And what usually adorns the Easter dress? The flower. They're beautiful. It's like the pinnacle of beauty. The pinnacle of freedom is a bird in flight. And yet Jesus says there's actually something more valuable. There's something more beautiful, more free than a bird in flight and a flower of the field. And it is a human being free of anxiety and worry and full of faith in the God that made them. God is the one who extends our lives. God is the one who clothes us with what we really need, his righteousness. Most of us spend time worrying about adding days to our lives, or we worry about the clothes in our closet. The human that is full of worry is not a human being. The human full of worry is not being at all. They're living in the future, a future that may not ever happen. That's not being. That's moving forward. That's, that's, that's living in a future. But the human that's full of faith, that's trusting in God, that is a human that is being. That's full of being, full of presence. And y'all, this is why worry is so incredibly disappointing. Worrying devalues the freedom given by faith and the beauty of righteousness for second tier prizes of comfort, happiness, and security. And our society reinforces the struggle after those second tier prizes. Worrying elevates important things. Eating is important. Drinking is important. Wearing clothes, very important. Please. But they're not the most important things. They're not the most important things. 
Worry takes these things and they shoves our face in it and it says, if you don't have this, you will die. Part of you will die. You will not be free. But faith looks to the author and perfecter of life and says, that can't be true. Because my God says there's something more important. You know what fruit I really like? I really like pineapple. I know, I'm exotic like that. Pineapple, so good. One day, one Saturday, my wife took a pineapple and she cut it up into little cubes and she put it in one of those Pyrex dishes and she just left it on the counter for us to kind of graze on throughout the day. And so my daughter also shares, Hattie, she shares a love of pineapple with me. And so between the two of us, we were just going after this thing. Well, at the end of the day, Hattie came to us and was like, Mom, Dad, my mouth hurts. And we were like, oh, she probably bit her lip or something like that. But fortunately, Google was listening. Because I got an article on like my feed that talked about how pineapple has an enzyme in it called bromelain. You didn't know about this? Bromelain is an enzyme that breaks down proteins and tenderizes meat. If you eat enough pineapple, as my daughter discovered that Saturday, it will begin to break down the, the, your mouth, basically. It can even to the, get to the point where your mouth will bleed if you eat too much pineapple. The article I read, and I love this, said that if you uh, take a bite of pineapple, the pineapple starts biting you back. And I'm like, ooh, I like that. I like this fruit even more, because it's sassy, it's got attitude. I like it. When you eat the pineapple, the pineapple starts eating you back. And this is how it is when we worry about things. We get so consumed with things we can't change, we can't affect, we can't bring about even if we tried. And by the way, this is the difference between worry and just prudence. Prudence is saying, oh, I'm going to retire one day, I'm going to establish a 401k. That's prudence. Obsessing about the 401k, that's not prudence. That's worry. That's fear. That's anxiety. We get so consumed with things we cannot change, and what happens is we gnaw on it. We chew on it. We devour it. It becomes our diet. It becomes our spiritual diet. We meditate on it. We reflect on it. It becomes the very words that we live by. Eventually, the thing we worry about becomes our God. And the thing that we consume begins to consume us. You become a person, not human being, but a human worrying. And you take bite after bite after bite and we wind up why we feel empty and frustrated and disappointed. It's because our diet largely consists of stressful things that we cannot affect and cannot change. Worrying, however, does have a really nice uh, side effect if we use it rightly. Worrying, anxiety, can push you to the one who will satisfy you. It can push you in that direction. So let's talk about the satisfaction of the kingdom. The satisfaction of the kingdom. Look at verse 31. Therefore, do not be anxious, saying, what shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the Gentiles seek after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them all. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Jesus makes a comparison between people of faith and people who are not of faith. And he basically says the difference is what they seek after what they're chasing after. You see, people that are not of faith are looking for all their joy, all their happiness, all of their fulfillment in things that they can attain today. And that makes sense. If you don't believe in anything after this life, get what you can get. That makes sense. Why would you live any other way? And to be honest with you, for believers, it's not wrong to want things. You ever consider? We need nourishment, yes. We need food, yes. But why did God make it taste so darn good? It's because it's not just a human being, a human living isn't just the consumption of food. It's the enjoyment of it. The clothes we wear, why are we so drawn to aesthetically pleasing clothes? I gestured at myself. I don't mean it like that. (laughs) But like, why are we drawn to like matching colors and, and trying to look a certain way? It's because we appreciate the beauty of it. There's nothing wrong with seeking after those things. It's when we become obsessed with it 
It's to become we, we, we continually seek after. We sum up life as having really good things. Maybe a way to test yourself is to, and to see if this is you is to say, how do I handle something bad that happens to me? Is my response to something bad, man, I need a drink. And I'm not talking about water. Or man, I need, I need something to eat. I, I, I feel so, I'm just upset. I'm going to eat this whole Ben and Jerry's thing right now. Or, man, I'm going to go on my Amazon wish list and just buy something because I feel bad. Or maybe that's the way you handle something that's good. Like, hey, let's celebrate. Let's go get a drink. Or, hey, let's celebrate. Cheesecake factory. Because the cheesecakes are good. Or, hey, I had a really great week this week. I'm going to treat myself to something. There's nothing wrong with that. But what happens is we eventually train ourselves to want those things and to only feel okay when we're celebrating or when we're, we're doing this thing that we use. And what happens is there's this little chemical in your brain called dopamine. And it's the way your brain trains you to do things that your brain likes. So every time you do something that your brain likes, your brain gives you a little bit of dopamine. It's like, ooh, that's good, do that again. And again, and again, and again. And it becomes about the reward. It becomes about the dopamine. We're like dopamine addicts. Right? You constantly seek after things that are going to make you feel good, feel right. It's what keeps you buying things you don't need. It's what keeps you eating after you're full. It's what keeps you drinking after you've had enough. And then it wears off. And we realize we're not satisfied anymore. And so we look for that dopamine hit again. But you see, Jesus says people of faith aren't like that. Look at verse 33. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be added to you. The kingdom is all we need. The kingdom is all we need. It's what we need to seek after. Now you may say, well, Travis, I don't think of it as a need. What's interesting is Jesus equates seeking the kingdom with seeking after food, water, and clothing, which means it's a primary need. And you may say, well, Travis, I don't feel that need. I don't feel a great need for broccoli either. But my body likes vitamins and minerals. I can cover that need up with a big old juicy hamburger. My body needs water. I can cover that need up with a Diet Coke. My body needs sleep. I also have Diet Coke for caffeine purposes. <laughs> Diet Coke's a big answer for me. You can mask your needs. And odds are you don't know that what you really need from the kingdom is the thing that only the kingdom can give you. Only the king can give you. And that's satisfaction. Satisfaction. That's what we need. That's what we've longed for. Because after we eat all the things or we drink all the things or we buy all the things and the dopamine wears off, you're left with just a bunch of things or a full stomach, but you're not satisfied. So how do you seek the kingdom? You want every single part of your life to be governed by the king. Every single component. Now, I know what you might think. You're going to run to the big categories in your life. You're going to say work, school, home, maybe personal life, and you're going to say, yeah, all those are pretty much in line, right? It's easy to do that. But let's drill down a little deeper. Let's talk about your marriage. Let's talk about your relationship with your spouse or your significant other. How do you talk to each other? How do you speak to one another? Do your words to each other bring flourishing and life, or are they cutting and sarcastic? Do you withhold saying kind words? How do you bless the other person? in your relationship. Do you ever do anything just to bless them? Do you ever lose out on something of yours so that they can be full and fulfilled? Maybe the biggest question is, how do you pray for your spouse? If you are not regularly and passionately praying for your spouse, your marriage is not governed by the king. Full stop. How about your relationship with your kids? Do you spend time with them sacrificially? You just work them in when you can. Do you yell at your kids? Now again, if your kid's in the street, car coming, yell at your kids. Go for it. But when you're frustrated, when you're angry with them, how do you speak to them? How about this? And this is one that was convicting for me. Do you make fun of your kids? Either to their face or behind their back? Do you use them as cute little stories with your friends? that would be embarrassing for them if they knew you told it? 
then the king doesn't govern your relationship with your kids. Does it rule over what you watch? Or do you make exceptions because it's just one scene and you can kind of skip ahead? Does the king rule how you spend your free time? Does the king rule your thought life? And every stray thought that comes in your brain, do you bring it before the Lord and say, Lord, I'm sorry, I have no idea why I thought that. I had this happen to me on the way in this morning. A person pulled in front of me, cut me off. I was a little angry about it. And I was like, why did I think that? That person, who knows where that person's trying to go? Maybe they're really excited about a little Sunday morning date. They were going to the lake, by the way. <laughs> I, maybe there's a church over there. I don't know. And this is what I mean by seeking. You might sit there and be like, wow, Travis, that's a lot of work. Do you know what it's like to get food? Because every single person in this room acquires money and uses some of that money to buy food, which we then either go to the grocery store and get, or we have delivered, or we go to a restaurant, and then we have to prepare it, Ugh. and then we have to eat it, and we got to wash dishes. It's a lot of work to seek after food. It's a lot of work to seek after drink. It's a lot of work to seek after clothing. How much time did you spend shopping for your Easter outfit? But we do it. And we do it without sometimes recognizing it. <clears throat> Seeking the kingdom is something that's hard and it requires just as much effort. We're just not used to it. If I asked my three-year-old daughter to go make something in the kitchen for dinner, the horrors that would come out of that kitchen <laughs> are unspeakable. Because she doesn't know yet. She doesn't know how to do that. She hasn't been trained. Some of us have not been trained or taught how to seek the kingdom. And that's one of the reasons why we need to be in a group. That's one of the reasons why we need to be in community with other people. So we can learn. And all of this revolves around prayer. Going to the Lord and asking for his guidance. Lord, show me the areas of my life that are not under your rule and reign. Now, before we finish, Jesus drops a, a statement of reality. He talks about the reality of trouble. Verse 34, therefore do not be anxious about tomorrow for tomorrow will be anxious for itself. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. This is kind of a proverb. And basically what Jesus is saying is you have enough things to worry about today. You don't have to borrow trouble from tomorrow, right? Each day is enough trouble of its own. Every day has conflict, challenges, difficulties, losses, mistakes, brokenness, accidents, and frustrations every single day. The things we're worried about happening in the future could very well happen to us today. In fact, many of them already have. And I think it's interesting because the word seek is used a couple times in this passage, but Jesus says here, you don't have to seek after trouble. Trouble's going to find you. Trouble's going to hunt you down. And while we're all out there seeking our happiness, seeking our joy, seeking even the kingdom, there's something that's hunting us, and it's trouble. It's trouble. And that's true. And you know that's true. If you don't believe another word I said, if you don't believe in a resurrection, if you don't believe in anything, you know trouble is a real thing in this world. And usually the way we handle it is to muscle through it, right? If I can just get through today, if I can just get through this week, if I can just get through this month, this year, if I can just get through this sermon, everything will be okay. Everything will be all right. But Jesus is saying trouble doesn't work that way because guess what happens when you get through today's trouble? Guess who's limbering up for round two tomorrow? More trouble. And then the next day, and the next day, and the next day. The reason why we're so anxious, the reason why we're so stressed, the reason why we're so worried is because what we believed as kids, that there was a boogeyman in the closet, that's true. The boogeyman is trouble. And it comes every single day. And you can't outrun it. And you can't outlast it. You can't outlive it. And it's on you every day. And I know you're thinking, wow, Travis, way to end on a high note. <laughs> but Jesus tells us something in John 16, He says, in this world you will have trouble, but take heart, I've overcome the world. That's interesting. Why doesn't he say, take heart, I've overcome trouble? Why doesn't he say that? Why does he say, I've overcome the world? Why is the world the problem? 
It's the same way as having a disease cured versus symptoms being treated. Jesus is saying we, are a part, we have trouble because we're a part of a system that's broken. Sin has entered into the world, brokenness has entered into the world, and we are a part of a broken system. Therefore, there is trouble. And God says, Jesus says, take heart, I've overcome the broken system. The broken system. And this has huge implications for us. First, let's go back to talking about mental health. You know, back in the day, if you struggled with mental health, you know what they called you? Troubled. You were troubled. So if you had depression, anxiety, you were bipolar, schizophrenic, whatever, postpartum, you were troubled. And you know what they did to troubled people? They treated the symptoms. They didn't treat the problem, they treated the symptoms. So what'd they do? Asylums, lobotomies, drugs, not medication, drugs. So like opium. Let's just sedate the person because we don't know what to do with them. And that's why it's critical because Jesus here doesn't say, I've overcome the troubled. He says, I've overcome the world. Because Jesus works with the people who are troubled. He's on your side. He's on my side. He's fighting with us against the things that terrorize us. He's rescuing us from them. He's going to heal us. He's going to deliver us. If not in this life, in the next. And we're going to live free from troubledness. But we also need to be fair to ourselves. Part of the trouble in the world is our fault. Despite my best efforts to be a good person, I still cause trouble. You can ask my parents. You can ask my wife, let's just be honest. I still cause trouble. Despite my best intentions, I'm still a problem. If I were to ask people in your life, is so-and-so ever trouble, they'd be like, yeah, sometimes they get on my nerves. Or sometimes they do this and it irritates me. It frustrates me. Because trouble came into the world through two people eating something they shouldn't have. Again, consumption, right? They ate something, and trouble entered into the world. But again, Jesus doesn't overcome people who are trouble. He overcomes the world. He overcomes the brokenness that makes us trouble. He forgives us for the sins we commit. He forgives us when we hurt others. He forgives us for our selfishness. He forgives us for being trouble and being in trouble. He forgives us. And he did this by dying on a cross for us. Because what happened is all the trouble in the world, all the brokenness got poured out on him on the cross. And he was the ransom, the consequences, the payment for our trouble Jesus took for us. And then he was raised to life. And this is why being resurrected is so important. Because the greatest trouble we face is death. And if you don't think that's true, go back to my illustration about eating right, getting a heart attack, and dying. The bad scenarios always end with death. And Jesus has conquered the grave. And he said, you don't have to worry about that anymore. You can put your faith in me. Bring your troubles to me. Bring the things that trouble you to me. The, the, the things that you've done, bring them to me. Let me pay for them. And I'll forgive you. And I'll clothe you in righteousness. And I'll give you freedom, freer than any bird has ever experienced. Come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. And isn't that what we want? Isn't that what's going to satisfy us? Rest. Jesus calls to you. And he says, you can keep trying to run from trouble, but the only way you're ever going to escape it is if trouble drives you to me. And I think it's one of the reasons why he lets trouble happen to us so that we can find real satisfaction in him and we can be shown that the second tier prizes of comfort, security, and happiness aren't going to hold up when real trouble hits. So what are your next steps today? Well, one of them, maybe for some of you, is to come to know Christ, to put your faith in him, to bring your trouble to him. Nobody's going to judge you for that. We've all done it here. Maybe not all of us, but some of us. Bring him your trouble. Maybe some of you need to show that you brought him your trouble a while ago and you need to get baptized. That's how you show the church community like, hey, I'm troubled, but I'm forgiven for being troubled. Maybe you need to join the church. Maybe you need to take a moment and you need to go over to the commons and you need to see Dr. Brad Schwal about anxiety and trouble that just really will not let you go and you need help 
finding a way out because you're so turned around. Trust me, I was there and it was a nightmare. You don't have to be there. Let Christ use his people to set you free from that. There's no need to continue on to it and don't do it for stubborn pride. That's borrowing trouble. Worrying is ultimately just going to be disappointing for you. You can keep doing it, but it's an empty diet. What you really need is the satisfaction that comes from knowing the king. Give him your life. Give him what's going on in your life. Give him your trouble. Because it's a reality. And it will keep hounding you. Give him every bit of trouble that comes your way. Because he knows just how to handle it. Let's pray. Gracious God, Heavenly Father, how good you are to us, Lord God. Because you don't sugarcoat things. Lord Jesus, you said there's going to be trouble, but you've overcome the world. Where the trouble starts, you got right to the root, right to the source of that evil, and you pulled it up by the weeds. And now, Lord, we just kind of deal with the side effects of it. I pray, Lord God, that you would set us free from trouble. I pray that you'd set us free from worry. I pray you'd set us free from fear. But not free so we can just do whatever we want, live a leisurely life. Lord, no, Lord God, free so that we can follow you and worship you. So Lord God, may you bless those who are seeking peace from their troubles. And may you set them free. And clothe them in your righteousness. And it's in your name we pray. Amen.